Good evening and welcome to tonight's live lecture. My name is Patty Simpson, Director of Online Programs here at the Leadership Institute. We're joined here this evening by Darren Miller, who is the Media Relations Manager at the Family Research Council. Darren, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. Well, just to talk about uh, how tonight goes, this is a live webinar and you can ask questions directly to Darren. So you'll be able to ask a question via the chat function directly below your screen, below the video screen, and those questions come directly to me and then I will, I will uh, ask Darren everything that you have to ask about crafting your conservative message. Now, I wanna get right into this. Darren, what do you have for us tonight? All right, um, thanks Patty. Well, my topic is developing and deliver delivering your conservative message. Um, so we'll get right to it. First question is, why should anyone care? Um, and that is the question. With everything going on in Washington, there are so many messages um, that are coming to the media from anywhere from the agriculture industry to social issues um, to just general politics, competing for space on the front page of the New York Times and the Washington Post and on, uh, for a time on uh, the major networks. So the job of press secretaries and people in messaging and communications is to simply uh, make reporters care enough about their candidate or their organization, what they're saying, um, to do something about it. For reporters, that's to, um, to write a story about it or put it on TV. Um, so hopefully this webinar will clarify a few things for you about messaging and about what press secretaries do and um, how to get your message out in Washington and around the country. So first of all, um, a common problem that we have to deal with in uh, Washington is, and, and everywhere is that people sort of have memory retention problems. Um, in a day they forget very little of what they hear, but two days later, as you can see from the slide, they forget a good 30% of what they're doing or what they've uh, listened to or seen online or things. Um, four days later, it's down to about 40%, and 16 days later, they've remembered almost nothing. So our job as uh, press secretaries and in the media is to distill messages into clear talking points and make sure that those messages um, leave a lasting impact. Um, hopefully, long term, but at least through the, uh, through the news cycle um, for the duration of a topic's life. So what is your message? Um, your message is what you're selling, it's your product. Um, so first question you need to ask is, do you have a good product? Um, what makes a message rise to the top? Um, it could be anything from, uh, well, first of all, what is your message? Um, it could be a new study on an issue. It could, be, um, it could be the talking points that you have about a specific legislative uh, initiative. Um, it could be a press conference, but um, it could be your candidate announcing that they want to run for office. Um, or for me, it could be an opinion article. A lot of what I do is I pitch um, op-eds to different newspapers. That's a more tangible product, um, but whatever the message is, um, it's your product and that's, it's your job to sell that. So first of all, do you have a good product? Um, sometimes product is not as strong as other times. You need to find the most compelling angle and work that. Um, secondly, can you sell your product? Um, every product is not always an easy sell. Last year I was helping a group um, do a press conference on an issue that wasn't really getting much attention in the media at the time. So to pitch it, instead of focusing on the topic we were pitching, we focused on the people. Um, it was the first time, it was a group of pastors, and it was the first time that pastors had really spoken out on a specific topic, and so that was our news hook. Um, a lot of what I do at, at FRC is I pitch a number of scholars to the media. So it's like having a series of candidates to pitch. Um, and, and so I try to focus on who, uh, who each of them are and their issue set. Um, and that's what you need to do as well. If your product is a candidate, um, if your candidate is, is strong on certain issues, but not on others, try to play to the issues that they're strong on. And you want people to think positively about your candidate. So um, when they see them on TV, um, you want your audience to see them as intelligent, fair, and representing their views. Um, that last part is messaging and spin, which this is what we're talking about here. But um, also remember that a candidate is not just a laundry list. They are not just a string of accomplishments that make them, um, make them seem cool. You have to translate those into policy ideas. So if they were a member of the military, it's not just 
um, look at me, thank you for my, um, you should thank me for my record. It's, I know what um, will best protect this nation, what, uh, what we need in our military because I've had that experience. So when you tote your candidate's record, you need to tie it into policies. Um, sorry, okay. Um, now let's talk about messaging. Um, a message equals, uh, the code is M equals EC3. So a message equals emotion, contrast, connection, and credibility. I like this quote here on the screen by Dale Carnegie. Um, he says uh, that the truth has to be made vivid, interesting, and dramatic. And today, that's what you have to have. You can't just put a study out there with a, a bunch of facts in it. You need to distill it and tell the media why it's important, and that's when they will connect with it and then um, write about it and get it out to the general public. Um, so remember that um, every message you're trying to send while the target audience might be the general public or for us, usually social conservatives, um, you have to first catch the attention of overwhelmed and overworked reporters. So anything you can do to make their job easier, providing them uh, good quality soundbite quotes and distilling information or helping them get interviews um, will make it more likely that those reporters come back to you in the future. Um, and it makes their job easier and eventually will make your job easier. So first of all, um, on messaging, one last thing. Um, Carnegie said um, that TV does it, the movies do it. And um, I bet if you take your favorite TV show and you look at one episode, you'll be able to find all four of these, um, these in an episode, the emotion, the contrast, connection, and credibility. Um, by the end, when you find the episode's message, you'll be able to identify how they use these four items to reach, um, to reach their uh, conclusion. Um, crime shows and medical shows both do this very well. Now, um, when you're talking about emotion, mm -hmm. I noticed that the left does this very, very well, yeah. that they connect on an emotional level. How do you think conservatives, because we're crafting our conservative message, how do you think conservatives can harness emotion while still keeping logic in the message? Um, that's a great question, and I agree um, the left does a very good job with emotion, and it's often because they'll say something like, wouldn't it be great if blank, if everybody could have blank? And um, it tugs at your heartstrings because you would love to have a perfect world, but um, it's very difficult to just give things away if you don't have money to do it. So conservatism being built on logic, um, we need to play to that strength, but we also need to do it in an emotional way. Um, so at FRC, um, we know images ha um, have a lot of power, and so we had a campaign called The Power of the Image um, on the pro-life is life issue, where we would have um, people send us pictures of their ultrasounds, along with pictures of them um, grown up, with a uh, tweetable bite about themselves, and so that people could see the connection between um, the ultrasound, which is generally has, people have a very emotional reaction to that and the living human being that is um, for them now. So, um, but there's another aspect to emotion and that's that um, emotional arguments are powerful but just using a logical argument, you want your audience to have a certain emotion, um, emotional reaction to that. So if you're combating a legislative action, you want your audience to have a very negative reaction to that legislation and so even if you're using a logical argument, you have to try to do it in an emotional way. Great, thanks so much. Sure. Um, all right. So the next one is um, contrast. So uh, how are you different? And this applies not only to how your message is different um, or your candidate is different from the left, but it also applies to how you are different from like-minded candidates or organizations. Because with the media, um, you need to be able to rise above not only the other side's talking points, but other talking points that are similar to yours. What makes your talking point the most concise and most punchy, the one that, um, that the media is going to go to? And so um, my, that's my goal at FRC, is to make sure that our scholars are the, the go-to scholars. Um, for example, one of our scholars, Jeannie Monahan, um, 
She worked under President Bush and President Obama at the Department of Health and Human Services. That's one of the things that I really play to when I'm trying to pitch her to the media. It's one of the things that makes her stand out. She has a lot of experience in um, the federal government. And having that health and human services angle um, makes her the perfect person to talk to, uh, for the media to talk to about uh, conscience protection and things like that. Uh, I also like the quote here by Chris Matthews. I don't always agree with Chris Matthews, but um, as a host, he is always bold and dramatic. And that's why he has his own show. He was able to rise above the fray. Next, connection. Um, why should your audience care? Um, this is one of the ways you hook your audience. In a press release, for example, we try to use the most interesting fact first. At FRC, we have an arm called the Marriage and Religion Research Institute, and they churn out a lot of data, and it's concise in the sense that it's about 20 or 30 different talking points. But what our job is is to pull the key nugget out and to make that the lead and present that to reporters first. What's the most uh, dramatic key point that uh, they can latch on to? And that's something that gives people then, um, the general public, something to latch on to. Um, it's connected to um, emotional arguments as well. There are so many issues that Congress is facing, or are facing every single mm -hmm. day. And everyday Americans, we just don't think about those issues. Mm -hmm. How do the communications teams of these elected officials, of people who work at nonprofits, mm -hmm. who work at organizations, how do we craft a message that connects with people? What mm -hmm. is the key to that where it's issues that nobody actually cares about? Uh, let's say it's the BP oil spill. Mm -hmm. That. How do you take a conservative message to that when nobody really cared about it unless they were living down in the Gulf mm -hmm. Coasts? I mean, someone who lives in Montana might not mm -hmm. really care much about it, but how do you take that example and then turn it into an overarching theme or message mm -hmm. about conservation versus environmentalism? Mm -hmm. um, I think part of that is you have to look at um, the strategies that BP and then other organizations used. They tried to relate it to um, obviously, one, to show that there were a lot of jobs at stake if things were, if um, there were new regulations put in. But also, they tried to show that, in general, it's very safe, um, the drilling that they do. And I think, um, on a conservative side, we need to look at the effect of what um, higher regulations has on gas prices and how that will impact um, the average person. Um, so it takes an issue that happened in another state, mm -hmm and it brings it on a national level and then kind of ping-pongs it over to your mm -hmm. back pocket and your wallet mm -hmm. and your small town in another part of the country mm -hmm. completely. So that's the, yeah. the goal of the messaging, the yeah. connection. Absolutely. All right, thanks. Absolutely. Um, I guess the next one is credibility then. And um, so why should your audience believe you? Um, this is incredibly important. It's the whole, trust me, I'm a doctor thing. Um, this is where you, uh, you need to source things properly in a study and you need to include um, titles and education in your press releases when you say that um, this scholar who is also is, has a doctorate from Yale or something, um, you include things like that to give them credibility. Um, one of the best ways on social issues to lend credibility is to try to cite to like an Ivy League study or um, on the life issue, specifically, to use a Guttmacher statistic. Guttmacher was formerly the research arm of Planned Parenthood. So if you use a statistic from Guttmacher, but you show how it actually um, helps the pro-life cause, that will have a lot more impact with a Washington Post reporter than if you used a study from a conservative or pro-life organization. And we actually have a question from one of our viewers at home. It says, for conservative candidates running for mm -hmm. office, how do you handle how the liberal media Mm -hmm. is constantly leaning on you for answers about social issues. Mm -hmm. Do you fight back on it and mm -hmm. talk about the reason why we're, we're in line with social issues this way? Or do you, and you risk the, mm -hmm. the label of a religious fanatic, mm -hmm. possible, possible, possibly, um, or do you just play it down? How do you address that? 
Um, that really depends on the, the issue area. It sort of depends on where we're at in the fight. At this point in the life issue, we're pretty far along. We've had some really good legislative victories. And we are at the point where you can get sort of bipartisan um, groups together generally to work on a piece of legislation. Um, so we try to be as positive as possible. That's the power of the image. Stem cells is another issue where um, the embryonic stem cell battle is very contentious. Um, but what we try to do at FRC is we have a campaign um, called Adult Stem Cells Saved My Life. And we show how um, adult stem cells, which are your stem cells just taken from your body, um, and there's no moral issue with that, um, how they are actually more effective than embryonic stem cells and are being used now to treat people, whereas embryonic stem cells are still in a very early stage. And one of the most recent studies with it was actually shut down. Um, so that's one of the ways we try to be as positive as possible with the messaging there. And I think that's one of the things that conservatives need to do more is try to be positive. Liberals are very good at using emotion and being positive, saying, look at this, this great couple. They're gay, but they're raising their children well. And we need to show how strong families, um, strong traditional families, are able to bring up their children even better, things like that. So how do you, an, as a follow-up mm -hmm. from another person watching at home, and once again, thank you for all the questions. These are great questions, so keep them coming. Um, how can a conservative candidate de debate a liberal opponent mm -hmm. effectively when part of the messaging strategy mm -hmm. involves emotion mm -hmm. and their emotional connection to the audience member or the voter mm -hmm. is just as powerful as yours and perhaps more powerful mm -hmm. because they play to fairness. Mm -hmm. And you know, we learned about being fair on the playground yeah. when we first went yeah. to kindergarten. How do you, how do you debate effectively? Well, actually, that um, sort of comes to one of the things in credibility, does your audience believe you? Um, using, using statistics, I think, where you can say, I agree with the 71% uh, the of Americans who support parental consent laws. We'll have, uh, where you can use a study or a fact or something tangible to show that you have a majority on your side. Or um, using a study that shows um, the negative effects of abortion and the positive effects of women who go through and have their baby. Um, using stats like that can be, I think, more powerful than um, some of the liberal uh, talking points. Um, I, so I personally, always have, yeah. your, have your emotions backed up by facts. Mm -hmm. yeah, because absolutely. as much as it's nice to be touchy-feely, mm -hmm. everything's wonderful, it's American voters like things to be backed up by facts. Yeah. yeah. All right, so that's the, the rule. You heard it here first, folks. Facts <laughs> win over, over emotions. Facts over feelings. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sound like my father. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, OK, next up we have an example of really bad messaging. Um, this was from 2003. And um, this is when the proper, uh, partial birth abortion ban was put in place. And this is a great example of a wonderful event that was tarnished by a really terrible, uh, terrible messaging. Um, you have President Bush signing the legislation and then shaking hands with the lawmakers who helped pass it. And all of them are pretty old, and all of them are men. And this is an issue. Still yeah. an ongoing issue. Yeah, still. It's exactly this We picture. haven't learned no. from it. No. This picture and, yeah, exactly, the effects of it have resonated for years. Um, if they had included women in this picture, which, and that's something that we try to do more now is just be, uh, a pay attention to the messaging. But, um, yeah, because yeah, when really someone looks experience. at this, and I mean, it is coming from the Washington Post, mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, when I see this, it's, this is wonderful, abortion, you know, getting rid of, stopping partial birth mm -hmm. abortion is fantastic, but... This is a picture of old white men who look like they've been in office forever that aren't women. Mm -hmm. like, why isn't there a single yeah. woman in the picture? Yeah. And it looks like they're stodgy old men who are just trying to punish women for now. Do you think this is this picture is in there? Do you think there possibly were women on the outside of the picture, mm -hmm. and it's just an example of media bias, or do you think it was just the conservatives not planning? 
I think it was it could have been a little of both, but it's really the job of the press secretaries and the communications people to make sure something like that doesn't happen. Right. So um, I guess next we will move on to the Leesburg grid, which is a good way to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of your arguments and to find uh, credible contrasts between um, what you believe and what your opponent believes or who you are and who your opponent is. So we have uh, us on us. This is what you um, and people on your side think about your candidate. And then there's us on them, what you are trying to convince voters about your, uh, your opposition. Them on us, what they're trying to say about you. And them on them, who they think they are. So we have a good example here from 2008. Um, we have the McCain, McCain and Obama race. Um, if you look at McCain, it's a pretty good, pretty fair uh, summary of who he was. He was a, a longtime senator, very experienced leader. He was a war hero. He had a lot of character. He was a, he was a maverick. He was an independent, and he did his own thing. And I think people liked that. He was definitely a moderate. Um, the problem is the Obama admin, uh, campaign was able to paint him as a creature of Washington and a Bush clone. He was not a Bush clone by any means, but they were able to make it seem like that. And for a very short time, he was able to make it look like uh, Obama was a celebrity and an elitist. But it didn't stick because the hope and change message and the fact that it was a history-making um, campaign cycle is uh, really what, what won the day for Obama. Is it because the Obama campaign stuck to their box, their, their message about themselves better than the McCain campaign did. The, the McCain campaign was never able to quite stick to that maverick. It was instead tied to the Obama campaign. was mm -hmm. very good at tying the McCain campaign to the Bush mm -hmm. administration. It, and people were yeah. just ready for change. They yeah. really liked that idea of hope and mm -hmm. change. Yeah, and I think Partially, we've been at war for years, and McCain was uh, very pro-military. He had served for many years, and I think that made him look like a Bush clone more than really any of the other issues would have. If they had looked at some of the uh, other economic issues out there, I don't think you would have been able to compare him quite as easily to, uh, to Bush. Because when you're crafting your conservative message, you don't just stick to one part mm -hmm. of being a conservative. There's mm -hmm. many aspects to it. and. In 2008, they just weren't able to, to quite diversify. Now I know that the next Leesburg <clears throat> grid is a bit more fun. Yeah, still <laughs> maybe just as contentious, yes. but yeah, a bit more fun. I agree. Um, we have Pepsi and Coke. I'm a Coke person. I don't know what you are, Patty. Um, I'm a Diet Dr Pepper girl. Oh, okay. All right. So we need <laughs> a new is Leesburg a Coke grid, product. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, Coke, Coke is classic, and I think that's what I like about Coke. It's classic, it's, um, it's the real thing, as they say, and uh, it's that taste that, I mean, as soon as you taste it, you know it's Coke. Whereas, personally, as a Coke fan, I think that Pepsi is a bad imitation. However, if you look at the Pepsi ads and the logo, it is um, much hipper, and it really is the new generation. They have a lot of club music in their ads, and Coke has polar bears. So. I think, um, yeah, there's a real difference between the two, and Pepsi can definitely paint Coke as being boring and stodgy, whereas uh, Coke has to fight the bad imitation, fight for the bad imitation. So, absolutely. Now, it's I always say though that Coke wins out because you never, I never hear someone at a cocktail reception asking for a whiskey and Pepsi. That's a good point. It's a whiskey yeah. and Coke. That's a good point. So. That's a good point. All right, so now we'll get into um, types of public relations. There are two basic types, offensive and defensive. Stay offensive. Defensive is not fun. That's typically when um, the candidate you're with or the organization you're with has said something wrong and you are trying to backpedal. Um, and when that happens, you basically need to try to figure out a way to say, well, we're getting away from the issue, or yes, but look at what they're doing, or something along the lines of that. And sometimes you need to just flat out come out and say, I'm sorry. Um, but always be offensive as much as possible. Um, if you can frame the debate, being on the offensive, if you can frame the debate and choose the language and make your opponent respond to you, you can win much more easily. 
Um, a great example of that is the life issue, where for many years it was framed as a choice. Well, nobody wants to be anti-choice. Um, so as a, a choice, most people want to be pro-choice. But if it's framed as abortion, which it's more framed as now, it's a more neutral term and people sort of know what they're talking about. As a pro-lifer, I like to frame it as a life issue and nobody wants to be anti-life. So um, another issue where uh, sort of how you frame the debate really matters is the marriage issue where the wording in a poll can change the swing of a poll significantly. Um, the Washington Post did a poll last year where they asked, do you think it should be legal or illegal for gays and lesbian couples to get married? And 53% said that it should be legal, of course, because nobody wants to make something illegal for anyone. But um, a month later, a public opinion poll, strategies poll, found that 53% of Americans strongly agreed with the statement, I believe marriage should be defined only as between a union between one man and one woman. So that swing can really be accounted for by wording because it's a very similar poll. And um, no one wants to see anyone's rights restricted. So if you say, I believe X um, should have the same rights as Y, well, then people will generally agree with you. It really comes down to wording. Um, and that's where press releases come in, which we'll get into shortly. So uh, talk about dealing with the media now. First of all, the media is not your enemy. Um, a lot of, on the conservative side, we talk about the liberal media and liberal media bias a lot. And there is a lot of media out there. But we also have to, um, to recognize that the media is largely overworked and very stressed out. And what we can do to help get our message out there is be the ones to call them, and the ones to email them, and the ones to make sure that they've seen our press releases and just try to help them as much as possible. If we can't, we refer them to another organization that can. Um, I think most media are trying to just deliver an accurate story because if they don't, they know that in the comments section, they're gonna have 300 comments saying, well, this is liberal media bias. Um, the press doesn't need you, you need them. If you don't get them the quote, then they either won't run it or they'll find another organization that will. So they don't need to come to you. You need to work to help them. But ultimately, your job is to get your story and your message out. Um, so you do this by first building a relationship with reporters. You don't need to be their best friends. But um, if you are working with, have worked with a reporter on other stories, it's much easier to get your quote in that story on op-eds. If I have pitched an op-eds to a publication in the past, it's easier for me to say, hi, Jim, I have this op-ed. This is why you should run it. This topic's in the news right now. It's much uh, more likely that they will run the piece. Um, the press is a tool, and you need to remember that. Um, they can spread your message more powerfully and effective than you can by simply sending an, um, a letter out to your supporters. And they can do it much cheaper than advertising. You can pay $10,000 for a TV spot, but if you did an interview for three to five minutes, then you would be able to get the same impact for free. And this is where uh, press secretaries are very important. Finally, um, in campaigns, as much as possible, one person should talk to the media. Um, just having a unified front is, is always best. It's a little different at an organization like FRC, where we cover a lot of different, um, different topics very heavily. But we try to have one person uh, as the spokesperson for each topic as much as possible. So what the press secretary does is they deliver the message, and they defend the message, the image. Um, it can differ from place to place, but on the Hill and in a campaign, the press secretary will often handle smaller interviews, and then they'll speak on background with reporters, just sort of um, giving them an idea of what's going on without giving a direct quote. The press sec secretary always stays on message. It's their job to spin what's going on in Washington, and they defend the image of the organization or candidate. Sometime that's by filtering who gets to talk to the candidate, um, but that's what their job is. It's to filter and spin. What do you do if you're a campaign, a very small campaign, and you 
don't have the money to have a full-time press secretary. Who handles that? Probably the chief of staff. Um, or the campaign but, manager, if it's yeah, a really small Yeah, or the campaign manager, race. yeah. yeah I, well, yeah, I guess often the campaign manager becomes the chief of staff. Right. Right? But yes, yeah, the uh, campaign manager. Yeah. All right. And does it have to be someone who's very experienced working with press or just someone that knows how to stay on message? Yeah, basically, if you know how to stay on message, that will, I mean, if, it doesn't matter if a talking point sounds like a talking point because it's better than if you mess up and say something you don't want to say and then have to apologize for it. Because most of the time you're talking to print reporters and if it sounds like a talking point, I mean, they didn't hear you say it, so it's not that big of a deal. And you can often do a lot of messaging through email where it's easy to craft the, uh, craft the quote first before you send it off to a reporter. So you don't have to be as media savvy you just know how to stay on message, need to know how to stay on message and not I get I actually have a question from one of our viewers, and they live in Minnesota and 15 years old, great job, love it when people, young people get into politics early. Mm -hmm. And I also love the state of Minnesota, I used to call it my second home. Um, but this person is getting an internship in a local conservatives campaign office talking about it being a very liberal state and the media is liberal as well. How should they, should you bring the truth to the media first before they have a chance to twist it into lies? How do you go about that kind of circumventing the, the liberal media but still trying to get your side of the mm -hmm. story out there? And one thing I would add is, as an intern, a 15 year old intern on the campaign, make sure you talk to senior staff first <laughs> before you go and talk to uh, the media because they're definitely going to want to handle this themselves, but it's called moxie and you have it so Great job, but how would you handle that in a very liberal state in a situation like that? Um, part of it is you just need to get your message out So you may have to just talk to the media that's available and just push as much as possible with them I mean you can't in the end help what happens to the quote that you give as long as you've given the quote you've done your job that being said, the internet is a wonderful thing, and if the media is not covering the story properly, there are great organizations like Media Research Center who you can go to and say, they're leaving this part out, can you help us? And they can get a story that will get thousands of grassroots people from all over the country um, to write those different, uh, different publications or TV stations and say, you need to cover this fairly. So that's, I guess, what I would recommend. All right, and you can definitely win the the PR war, so to mm -hmm. speak, war on the internet because there's mm -hmm. so many blogs out there yeah. and there are conservative leaning mm -hmm. websites that people visit mm -hmm. quite often and it's not just uh, reading a newspaper mm -hmm. anymore, it's people who look to the internet to get mm -hmm. their news. I believe the Drudge Report is one of the top 10 most visited websites mm -hmm. in the country and that definitely slants conservative mm -hmm. in, in the stories that it offers. So there are ways around it mm -hmm. and use what Darren has talked about and, and just find that avenue. Mm -hmm. The other thing is even in, in liberal states, the talk radio is generally pretty conservative. And that's a great way to get the message out to just general listeners, the general population, without having to go through the newspaper and the TV stations. And so. And always remember that the chances of you changing a liberal's mind are slim to none. So you just want to focus on, mm -hmm. on getting in contact with those independent voters and firing up the base of conservative voters. Absolutely. It's a, moral outrage is a very, very um, highly motivating force in yeah. politics. So keep that in mind. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. So uh, next up, the press secretary. These are a couple of the nuts and bolts things that a press secretary does. And the first is they need to know who they're contacting so they develop a media list. And you can do this a couple different ways. One is you can use media database tools like Cision and Vocus. Kind of weird names, but they're great, uh, great tools. And basically they have the names of most of the major journalists from around the country, um, the contacts in, uh, in print, in TV, and radio. So if you know the name of someone but don't know how to get a hold of them, you can just type that into the database and it'll bring up their contact information. Um, another way is you can just simply 
Google to figure out what reporter is covering the uh, topic that you want to talk about, and then call their organization. It's good to know who you want to talk to at an organization at like a TV station or newspaper first, because if you don't, they'll just drop you off in the general newsroom uh, voicemail, and you probably will never hear from someone. So make sure you know who you're trying to reach. If you don't have a specific name, ask if there's an email address you can send to, because you can always just call uh, email over and over again until someone answers. Um, but typically, it's good to just have a name and try to work through a name first. Um, another way to get the message out, if you don't have necessarily a media list, is to use uh, a newswire. Uh, we use PR newswire, which basically you send the press release to an organization that blasts it out to journalists all over the country who are writing on a certain aspect of the economy or the social issues or something like that. And uh, that's a good way to, uh, to handle that. Um, the next thing is writing press releases. Um, press releases are one of the top ways to get information out. Um, it's not that difficult to write them as long as you know what you're doing. It's generally a paragraph or so where you're talking about, uh, where you write the facts of whatever you're trying to spin, and then you have some quotes underneath it. Um, they should stay at around 400 words, but we'll get into that in a little bit. And then finally, you use um, advisories, photo releases, and then you conduct news and press conferences. Um, so those are some of the things that a press secretary will do. But probably the most important thing is that press release. If your operation is in a small town or you know, a, a rural county mm -hmm. where all you have is a, you don't have a daily newspaper, you might have a weekly and in some cases bi-weekly, how do you suggest working with that kind of media when it is very local and mm -hmm. you have the opportunity to develop relationships with these reporters? Mm -hmm. How do you go about doing that? If you have reporters who are, are friendly and are willing to talk to you, especially once you're established as a congressman or something, it's really easy to do this, but um, you can talk to them multiple times or sit down and have coffee with them and sort of, like you can, if, if it's not breaking news every day, then invite them on the campaign trail for a day or two to write a really in-depth feature story about it, things like that. So I guess that's what I would recommend. Okay. So don't be afraid of the media all the time. It's no. just simply because the media leans liberal, mm -hmm. if a reporter does, does not make them automatically the enemy. Mm -mm. It's that you still want to be friendly with them because mm -hmm. your stories ultimately, you want them to end up in the newspaper or on TV or on the radio. So Absolutely. you need to develop the relationship no matter what. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Now, um, with writing an effective press release, um, Use AP style, that's very important. And one of the reasons is because most journalists use it. And so if you write a press release and it's in AP style already, they can copy and paste that quote and put it in a story instead of having to make edits to it and possibly messing it up and saying something that you didn't intend to say. Um, you can get an AP style book online or you can actually follow AP style book on Twitter and you can just send them questions if you have any and they can answer them pretty quickly. Um, only spin in quotes. You want, the, uh, you want the introduction of the press release to read like a news story. And then in your quotes, which you want to get quoted with, you can spin like crazy. Include your contact information. Um, I generally put a work phone number. And then I'll also put my uh, email address. And if, I'm, if a reporter contacts me, I'll often just give them my cell phone number as well. Um, I would rather have them call me at a weird hour than miss a big story. Um, the final things, uh, use 30 or the pound sign at the end of a release just so that the reporter knows they haven't missed anything. And then never ever lie, that should be self-explanatory. A lot of uh, former politicians would be happy to tell you why you shouldn't lie, um, but you can just Google their stories and uh, read about People have made the mistake, so don't do that. And we actually, if you want a little bit more of an elaboration on how to write an effective press release, on the Leadership Institute's YouTube page, we have a short quick tip video mm -hmm. that outlines it exactly the way it should, it should be, uh, should be out, outlined and the way you should write everything and the contents and 
as, as well as this is being recorded, so you can come back and check it out, what Darren's telling you to do. But if you want to check it out immediately after this, you can just go to our YouTube page. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so one of the things you do with a press release is you write it like a news story. You use the inverted pyramid. You use a really, really short headline as much as possible. You want that headline to be something that people can read very easily in their inbox. And then you put the most important information at the top and work your way down. It's uh, pretty straightforward and I would definitely recommend checking out the YouTube video. Next, some behind the scenes things. Um, if you're working with the media, as much as the media is your tool and your, don't be afraid of them, don't let your candidate or your spokespeople take direct calls. You are the filter first. Um, you, the last thing you want to happen is for a journalist who has your candidate's personal, to have your personal phone number for your candidate, and they call them up with a breaking story and get a quote that is out of context or your candidate didn't know enough um, to be quoting. And then you have to do a lot of backpedaling, um, backpedaling work. Uh, never let the candidate provide an interview without proper advance work either. This is the same sort of thing. They need to know all the details of the story. They need to know what quotes they should be giving and what they shouldn't. And you should also clue them in on a couple of the curveball questions that will probably be coming their way. Um, proper advance work will make them look intelligent instead of baffled and unprepared in an interview. Also, never lie to a reporter. It's the same sort of thing. If you lie in a press release or to a reporter, it will be online, and it will be online probably forever. So don't do it. Um, only spin in quotes as well. Um, if you spin in the rest of the press release, it can't get quoted. So make sure you put your angles in the quotes. And then help the reporter out. Um, get them what they need to get that story into the newspaper. If you can't, point them in the direction of someone who can. If your candidate can't speak to something or your organization can't, then send them to another organization which can. And then that reporter will come back to you knowing that you are not just a resource for your issue but others. That really helps with the developing of the relationship. Um, and then framing the debate. Uh, he who frames the debate most often does win it. Um, the partial birth abortion uh, debate is a great example of this, that picture aside. Um, the actual procedure of a partial birth abortion is called dilation and extraction. But by taking the sterile name away from it and calling it what it actually is, a partial birth abortion, the pro-life movement was able to transform that debate into one about life and not just about choice. Um, it made it easier to win, though it was a contentious battle. Finally, stay on message. This is vitally important. We've all watched uh, journalists just tear people, tear guests apart on TV when they've gotten them off message. Um, if you stay on message and just try to redirect back to your one or two talking points, um, you'll do much better in a TV interview. Um, here are some transitional phrases. Um, Basically, when you go into a TV interview, know that you're only going to get one or two points across. So come up with the points that you want to make and make those. And if they try to get you off topic, try to bring it back to the important issue. So if, that, if this is taught, and assuming that most conservatives mm -hmm. would learn about these, at least when they're preparing for debates, why don't most candidates use these all the time? Why does it... Why is it so easy to ruffle their feathers and get them off message when these transitional phrases are fairly easy to remember, to pivot? You know, when, well, mm -hmm. that's an interesting question, but the moms and dads and everyday Americans that I talk to are really concerned about this. Mm -hmm. Why is it so easy to rattle someone? I think part of it is the journalists have been doing this for years, and the candidates have often been doing it only for a couple of months. And... I think also just not having adequate training. I know LI does some great trainings on this sort of thing, and I think a lot more candidates need to go through that before they decide to run. Yes, we do um, offer a fantastic future candidate school, if anyone would like to take it. But you can check out all of the trainings we have under the trainings tab, and, uh, and we have some great resources 
for anyone thinking about running for office or working on a campaign or just working for an organization or some sort of issue in general, uh, we can help you with that. But yeah, it's, I don't know, I always, whenever I see someone on TV mm -hmm. and they get asked that, question that's mm -hmm. going to throw them for a loop. I say, pivot, pivot. You yeah. need to pivot on this. Yeah. Stick to your message. Stick to your message. Mm -hmm. But I've been doing this training stuff for a while, so yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> I'm used to it, and I'm yeah. not in the hot seat. And I think part of it is when people are in front of the camera, they forget that it's not just what they say. It's what they look like. If you're smiling and if you're just trying to stay calm and not let the journalist fluster you, People will like you and they'll respect you more. Unless you're Chris Christie, you need to smile during an interview. <laughs> there are very few people who can get away with it without it and make people like them. But um, our president, Tony Perkins, a lot of people will tell him they don't agree with what he says, but they like him as a person. And it, it's because when he's in front of the camera, he comes across as very reasonable. He stays calm and he smiles a lot. So, yeah. so a key to, I that's the connection with people. Mm -hmm. It's a smile connects you. So it's yeah. not just uh, what you say, it's what people see. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And then I guess uh, final thoughts. Um, remember the messaging formula. Use the grid to develop your message, and that's very important. And then stay on message. Um, that's really one of the most important things is stay on message. Well, Darren, thank you. We have a few questions from our viewers at home. And just to let you all know, this is being recorded and it will be available early next week uh, for you to watch on our Activism On Demand video page. And you can visit that by going to www.leadershipinstitute.org slash activism on demand. Uh, and you can view past webinars and some other great videos that we've made here at LI Studios. One of the questions we have, going back to young people mm -hmm. and connecting with young people, it's very difficult. A lot of people say that conservative, conservative views are losing issues with the younger generation. Mm -hmm. it's, they believe in completely different things. How important is it to, for conservatives to focus on the younger generation and college-age voters? And how do you craft your conservative message mm -hmm. to, to connect with them? I think it's vitally important. If we don't have the younger generation, then um, the movement will die out. Um, and I think the only way to really connect with young people is to bring them into the discussion and say, why, what issues do you really care about? And for those issues you don't care as much about, why? Let's talk through this and let's see if we can explain it in a different way. And I think a lot of it is that for so long, um, I think conservatives have sort of been that angry movement and we don't know how to portray our messages in a very positive light. And I think young people really like to latch on to positive things. And if we can make the debate about life instead of about um, saying no, like anti-abortion, make it pro-life, that goes, um, a long way to bringing the young people into into the fold and the same on uh, on other issues I think it really we just need to focus on the positive um, messages okay um, here's another someone has been thinking about about blogging and they think that the, just everyone is blogging mm -hmm. so what is the point of having one more conservative blog out there Mm -hmm. Would you encourage this person to start blogging or discourage them from blogging? If they want to sort of try to make a name for themselves, I would say go for it, start blogging. Um, but I think what you should also do is try to see if there's an established blog out there that would take some, some of your thoughts maybe. That's a good way to get a piece that's a little more pro high profile and um, they can also give you feedback. If they say no, you can ask them, well, what don't you like about this piece? Um, I think that's what I would recommend is try to, instead of starting your own blog maybe, try to work on another blog or write for another blog that's out there. There's also uh, a great organization called the Franklin Center. Mm. Uh, and what they do is they have a, a vast network of bloggers that focus on state-based issues. Mm -hmm. And so your blog can essentially serve as uh, a place that you write stories about the 
topic that you are researching, that you are becoming an expert on, and you can join their citizen watchdog network, and you can then get connected with conservative reporters within that state, because you might be uncovering some contradictions and hypocrisy within the state governments and your local governments that reporters just don't have the time to do, and they just didn't realize what was happening. So I would definitely check out Franklin centerhq.org which is the Franklin Center's website or just google them it's another mm -hmm. another great resource for people who want to get involved they're just not sure how to get the conservative message out and that's a great point um, this is another one more question about kind of the structure of how you answer a question when mm -hmm. asked and this person has always said you have three to five facts so when you're asked a question you take one of those facts First, you repeat the question, then you take one of those facts to reiterate your message, mm -hmm. then ask another question, and then take another fact. And is, mm -hmm. that, is that effective to, to only have three to five facts, or should you be able to speak at length about a topic? I think generally, yeah, the three to five facts is um, what you want to go with. Um, we try to, at FRC, we write one-pagers for... Um, on issues that we can give out to members of Congress or members of state legislatures because really a reporter is only going to use one quote generally from any, per any one person in a story and if you're confronted on the street you really only need to know a couple of um, a couple of facts to be able to refute um, refute anyone's uh, talking points I would definitely say I mean try to keep your answers short 30 seconds or less and uh, yeah, three to five points, unless you're sitting down to dinner with somebody and really debating it out, or are in a debate where it's all on one specific topic, the three to five points should be enough. So, so. basically learn to speak in sound bites. Mm -hmm. You want eight seconds yeah. that they can put in a quote, mm -hmm. or they can put in a TV interview, mm -hmm. and that sounds about right. Well, Darren, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, we're all very excited to have you over. Darren is married to one of the our wonderful employees here at the Leadership Institute, Emily Miller, who is coincidentally speaking at our next live lecture in two weeks. She'll be talking about how to land your dream job in the conservative movement. She's our Director of Employment Placement Services here at LI. Uh, they're, they're a conservative power couple on the <laughs> rise within the movement, and uh, I... I'm excited that I can call them friends as well, but thank you again for coming by. Uh, just to remind everyone that this has been recorded and will be available early next week. Thank you all for tuning in, uh, and make sure that you check out all the great trainings and events that we have to offer here at the Leadership Institute, whether it be online or it can be in the classroom or on the road, because we do bring trainings to your area from time to time. Uh, thank you so much, and have a great night.